Sassfeld Gobron contributed towards making it possible for diehard black nationalists like myself to accept that Zambia would have to be non-racial. Zambia would be a place for everybody to live and develop together. Now, in the annals of history, there are stories that defy convention and challenge stereotypes. And one such tale is that of Stuart Goldblum, also known by the Bemba name Chipembere, meaning rhinoceros. It would seem odd and even extraordinary that one man in his lifetime would receive a knighthood from an imperial monarch as well as the Freedom Medal from an African independence leader. But then again, Gold Brown was anything but an ordinary man. He was a soldier pioneer white settler, builder, politician, and champion of African self-determination. And upon his death in 1967, the first white man to receive a state funeral in Zambia. So then it's only natural to ask, who was Stuart Go Brown? Go Brown was born into a wealthy aristocratic family in London in 1883. His grandfather was a colonial administrator and one-time governor of New Zealand. His aunt, a few years his senior and whom he greatly revered, co-owned a deluxe hotel in Egypt and supervised the world's first purpose-built motor racing circuit. Go Brown was educated at Wixenford Preparatory School for five years and Harrow School for a further three. He passed into the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich in 1900 and was commissioned into the Royal Field Artillery. In 1911, Gold Brown was sent to Northern Rhodesia as part of an Anglo-Belgian boundary commission, surveying and laying out the border between the Belgian Congo and Northern Rhodesia. As a young boy, Gold Brown had an ambition to own an estate, but though comparatively wealthy, he knew he could not afford land in Britain. And so, when he heard in 1914 that the British South African company, which administered Northern Rhodesia, was selling land cheaply to white settlers in the northeast of the country, he quickly traveled there looking for land. He found the perfect place amidst rolling hills near the shores of a lake adorned with grooves of rare trees and esteemed by the local African communities. Legend told of the local tribe's auspicious encounter when they arrived from the Congo and discovered a deceased crocodile. Deeming it a sign of good fortune, they adopted the name Menangandu, or People of the Royal Crocodile, and settled around the lake which came to be known as Ishiwangandu, or the Lake of the Royal Crocodile. But by then, World War I had broken out and Gold Brown was sent to the Western Front, where he reached the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and was awarded the Distinguished Service Order. In 1920, he retired from the army and returned to Northern Rhodesia to settle at Shiwangandu and build his dream estate. However, building his dream home more than 400 miles from the nearest railhead would not be an easy task. The arduous undertaking began in Indola, where Go Brown and his carriers embarked on a 70-mile trek across the Congo axis to Kapalaga. From there, they switched to a 10-day canoe journey up the river Luapula, reaching in Sumbu in Lake Bangaruni. Continuing their voyage, they traveled up the Chambeshu River until they reached an old rubber factory. The final stretch was a further 70 miles from the rubber factory to Shiwa, which was covered on foot. The entire expedition, starting from Undola and ending at Shiwa, spanned at least three weeks.
After completion in its early years, Shiwangandu faced disappointments and challenges, with unsuitable soil for crops like maize and soaring transport charges. Undeterred, Gold Brown returned to England in 1927, where he married Lona Goldman, who was much younger and the daughter of his former love, Lona Boswith Smith. Together, they had two daughters, Lona Catherine and Angela. However, from 1934, the couple spent much time apart. Lady Go Brown did not share in her husband's dreams for the estate and they divorced in 1950, after which she moved back to London. To be completely honest, I never saw it as a very happy relationship. You know, by the time I could think and sort of see things, they would talk and... But I never really saw any of signs of affection between them, or very, very seldom. By definition, Stuart Gold Brown was a complex and determined man. He stood out as an unconventional figure. He was a stern and exacting leader, driven by an unwavering work ethic and expected the same dedication from his employees. By modern standards, his methods were at times cruel and draconian, but by the conventions of the 1920s, he was relatively enlightened and certainly not one who could be described as a racist. In fact, there was no racial segregation at Shiro. Go Brown's children and grandchildren mixed freely with African kids. First of all, I think, you know, it's the, there weren't any other children um, around, so, you know, the children all stick together, and so, and we were, it was nothing wrong in our eyes, um, you know, it wasn't, we found it a bit difficult with other communities who, um, other white children who didn't, play with blacks and we thought that rather strange. Furthermore, his trusted companion later in life was his African chauffeur by the name of Henry Mulenga. Unlike many other white settlers, Go Brown made effort to learn the local language Bemba and gradually built a thriving community on his new estate that emphasized training and education for the local people. Shua boasted its own schools, hospitals, post office, shops, and airstrip. And by the mid-1920s, the self-sufficient estate employed as many as 1,300 local workers. Go Brown's entry into local politics commenced in 1935 when he secured a seat in the Northern Rhodesia's Legislative Council through an election. Representing one of the constituencies, he held a distinct perspective on British colonial governance, feathering a future partnership rather than traditional trusteeship. His stance advocated for a greater involvement of settlers in the government while emphasizing the interconnectedness of prosperity of both white and black communities. And like some of his white political counterparts, Go Brown did not perceive African social and educational progress as a threat. Instead, he welcomed the addition of qualified voters from all backgrounds.
As demands for African independence grew louder, Gold Brown stood apart from many of his other white settlers by outrightly opposing segregation. Instead, he advocated for open dialogue and cooperation with the black leaders, pushing for their meaningful inclusion in the political process. Following World War II, he played a significant role as a mentor to independence advocates Kenneth Kaunda and Harry Kumbula, both of whom frequently visited his home. Go Brown even provided financial support to sending Kumbula to university in Uganda, further demonstrating his commitment to fostering education and empowerment within the African community. However, Go Brown's rather awkward position of trying to balance between white authority and black aspirations frequently led to conflicts with both sides. Further, his endorsement of a proposal to divide Northern Rhodesia into separate regions controlled by Europeans and Africans in 1948, with the Europeans retaining the lucrative copper belt mines, was met with disapproval from most black leaders. Simultaneously, his support for the United National Independence Party UNIP often resulted in clashes with the white community. Furthermore, his opposition to Roy Walensky's campaign for amalgamation between Northern and Southern Rhodesia led to his resignation from the leadership of the elected members of the Legislative Council in 1946. He then proposed a responsible government scheme aiming to bridge the division between white and black communities but faced setbacks in his presentation in 1948, which alienated his African supporters. Feeling that his political role had won, he resigned from the Legislative Council in 1951, choosing to devote himself to Shiwa. But despite his retirement, he continued to offer constant support to the African National Congress and later to the United National Independence Party, led by his close friend Kenneth Kaunda, whom he had mentored from an early stage. Lieutenant Colonel Sir Stuart Go Brown died between August 4th and August 8th, 1967, in Kasama, some 200 kilometers from Shiwa, and was buried at Shiwangandu, where he was given a chief's burial under his Bemba name, Chipembere. At Go Brown's state funeral in 1967, the first ever in honor of a white man, President Kaunda was lavish in his praise, describing Go Brown as a man born an English gentleman who died as a Zambian gentleman, and that if Africa had more men like him, the transition from colonial rule to independence would have been less traumatic. If I can only leave a beautiful home for the girls and a better country for all my people at Shiwa, then it will all have been worth something. <laughs>